Book Two, Chapter Eleven of Clara Vaughan, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ellen Preckle. Clara Vaughan, Volume One by R. D. Blackmore. Book Two, Chapter Eleven. In spite of the arnica, my cuts were not healed for a month. Not enough, I mean, for me to handle a pencil. Mr. Cutting, when he came, according to promise, told me something to quiet me, because I was so feverish. Whether he believed it, or only acted medically, was more than I could decide. The opinion he gave me, or the substance of it, was this, that the deed was done, not for money or worldly advantage in any way, but for revenge. Here I thought of Mrs. Daldy. What wrong the revenge was wreaked for, he could not even guess, or at any rate would not hint to me. That the straightest clue to the mystery was to be sought in Italy, where my guardian's track should be followed carefully. The idea of forcing or worming the truth from him was rejected at once through my description of his character, although the inspector quite agreed with me that, even if guiltless of the crime, Mr. Edgar Vaughan knew all about it now. That no importance should be attached to the anonymous letter from London, in accordance with my promise to Mrs. Elton I did not mention the Polish lady's name, and Mr. Cutting did not press me to do so, for he firmly believed from what I said that she had made a mistake in the address she gave, and would not help us now even if we could find her. That, nevertheless, a strict watch should be kept in London, whether flock nine-tenths of the foreigners who ever set foot in this country. London, moreover, was likely ere long to draw nearly all the migratory strangers to the business or pleasure of next year's great exhibition, provided only that it should prove successful, as the inspector thought it would. As for my enemy being attracted by works of industry, it seemed to me quite against nature that a base assassin should care for art or science or any national progress, but the remembrance of several cases among the dark annals I used to delight in soon proved to me my error while the long experience of a man versed from his youth in criminal ways convicted me of presumption. To put myself more on a level with fraud and stealth and mystery, I did a thing for which I felt guilty to myself and my mother. I changed my name, but, in spite of Inspector Cutting, I did not travel out of the family. My father's second name was Valentine, taken from his mother. This name I assumed in a shorter form, becoming Clara Valance. It saved change of initials and a world of trouble, and I felt warmer in it, because it seemed to have been my father's. In the neighborhood I knew no one except Mrs. Elton, to whom, as I grew intimate with her, I partly explained my reasons. As for Mrs. Shelfer, she was delighted at the change. She said that her Uncle John had christened me, and that it sounded much prettier, and would always remind her of Valentine's. Nevertheless, I longed for the day when I might call myself Clara Vaughan once more. By the time I was able to go about freely again and use my hand as of old, it was the middle of November. The first use I made of my pencil was to copy most carefully all that Inspector Cutting required. He promised to keep these drawings, and indeed the whole matter, most jealously to himself, by which term he meant, as I afterward found, Inspector Cutting and those to whom he was bound to report. What I now wanted was money to send an adroit inquirer throughout the north of Italy, and other parts where my guardian's shifting abode had been. I knew that he dwelt a while at Pisa, Genoa, and Milan, also at an obscure little village named Calva, which I could not find in the maps. All I had learned of his rovings was from the lessons my father would give me sometimes, when he used to say, Now, Tootie, put your finger on Uncle Edgar. To every one but myself it seemed a strange thing, that after so many wanderings Mr. Edgar Vaughan had brought no valet, major-domo, or courier, no dependent, nor retainer of any kind, not even a foreign friend to England, or at any rate to Vaughan Park. But now for the needful resources, the only chance of procuring them lay in my young and partly self-tutored art. I braced myself with the remembrance that while none of my family ever laid claim to genius, the limner's faculty had never been wanting among them, Inferior gifts are often as heirlooms in the blood, though high original power follows no vein except its own. The latter none of us ever possessed, but taste and the knack of adaptation had seldom been alienated. Observation, too, in a small way, and the love of nature seemed inborn in us all. My father's drawings were perfect, but for the one thing wanted, and in sketches from outdoor nature that want was less perceived. My grandfather had been known among the few amateurs of the day as a skilful colorist. As to habits of observation, a little tale handed down in our family will show that they had existed in one of its members seven generations ago. 
in the autumn of sixteen fifty one when king charles was stealing along from colonel wyndham's house to the coast of hampshire and sussex the little band was overtaken by nightfall somewhere near the new forest it was shortly after the narrow escape of the king from that observant blacksmith who saw that his horse was shod with north country iron though he was taking it easily his three trusty fangs knew well that a roundhead squadron was near and that his last chance depended on speed and night travel what could they do now in the tempestuous darkness they were in a tract thinly inhabited half woodland half heather and the road was hopelessly lost no rain fell as yet it was true and the wind was waiting for rain but the lightning came fitfully from the horizon all around the king alone was on horseback his three companions afoot they stood still in doubt and terror for they could not tell north from south suddenly major cecil vaughan espied a faint gleam familiar to him of old in the wasteland around vaughan park to an accurate eye there could be little doubt as to the source of the lambent light flame it could not be called it played in a pale yet constant stream on a certain kind of moss known to botanists not to me for the wastelands have been reclaimed this light is to be seen at no time except when the air is surcharged with electricity follow me all i know the way cried major vaughan right cheerily and if you do man said the king your eyes are made of clashers what this meant i used as a child to wonder but now i know for six dark miles the major led them without default until they came to a lonely heathman's house where they slept in safety he never told them how he did it being apt i supposed as men of the second order are to hug superior knowledge but it was a most simple thing that strangely sensitive moss follows the course of the sun and therefore the lambent light can only be seen from the west so all the time he could see it the others never saw it at all he knew that they were wending from west to east which was their proper course to return to myself i put the finishing touch of a view of rock and woodland scenery northwest of tossel's barton and set off to try my fortune with it some young ladies born to my position would have thought this errand one of much degradation but it did not appear so to me so i walked briskly for i hate an omnibus and could ill afford a cab to the shop of a well-known dealer in pictures not far from the haymarket it was my first venture into the heart of london but i found the way very easily having jotted it down from a map the day was dark and drizzly, the pavement grimy and slimy, and hillocked with mud at the joints of the flags. It was like walking on a peeled kneading trough with dollops of paste left in it. Along the far reach of the streets and the gardens in the squares, wisps of fog were crawling, and almost every one was coughing. The dealer received me politely, too politely, in fact, for it seemed to savor of kindness, which I did not want from him. What I wanted was business and nothing else. He took my poor drawing, done only in watercolours, and set it up in a square place made perhaps for the purpose, where the brown flaw fell upon it from the skylight, formed like a Devonshire chimney. Then he drew back and clasped his hands, then shaded his eyes with them as if the light were too strong, whereas the whole place was like a well turned upside down. He seemed uneasy, because I did not care to follow him throughout all this little performance. And now, I said, for my foolish pride was up, and I spoke as I would have done to the porter at our lodge, not with the least contempt. I was never so low as that, but with a long perspective. Now, Mr. Oxgall, it will soon be dark. What will you give me for it? Allow me, miss, allow me one moment. The light is a little too strong. Ah, the mark of the brush comes out. Strong touch, but indiscreet. A year of study required. Shade too broad and massive. A want of tone in the background. Great feeling of nature, but inexperienced rendering more mellowness desiderated full however of promise all the faults on the right side most energetic handling no weak stippling here but water-colours are down just now a deal depends on the weather and time of year how so mr oxgall hot sun and off they go fog and muck and frost and the cry is all for oil excuse me miss a thousand pardons your name escapes me you did not pronounce it strongly "'Miss Valance,' I said, with an emphasis that startled him out of his mincing. "'Miss Valance, you think me very long. All young ladies do. But my object is to do them justice, and if they show any power, to encourage them. Thank you. I want no encouragement. I know I can draw a little, and there it is. The fog is thickening. I have far to go. Your price, if you please.' I went up many steps in his opinion by reason of my curtness and independence. "'Miss Valance, I will give you three guineas, although, no doubt, I shall be a loser.' then don't give it i said in pure simplicity i went up several steps more how utterly men of the world are puzzled by plain truth 
Miss Valance, if you will forgive the observation, I would beg to remark that your conversation, as well as your painting, is crisp. I will take this little piece at all hazards, because it is full of character. Will you forgive me for one word of advice? There is nothing to forgive. I shall thank you heartily for it. It is simply this. The worst part of your work is the perspective, and figure drawing will be of service to you. Study at a school of design, if you have one near you, and be not above drawing stiff and unsightly objects. Houses are the true guides to perspective. I cannot paint or even draw, but I am so much with great artists that I know how well to advise. Thank you. Can you kindly suggest anything more? Yes. Your touch is here and there too harsh. Keep your hand light, though bold, and your brush just a little wetter. But you have the grand things quite unattainable when not in the grain. I mean, of course, freedom of handling, and an artist's eye. Do you think I could do any good in oils? I have no doubt you could, but not for a long time. If fame is your object, take to oils. If speedy returns, stick to water-colours. Leave me your address, if you have no objection, and bring me your next work. If I do well with this, I will try to give you more. He took from a desk three new sovereigns and three new shillings, wrapped them neatly in silver paper, and handed them to me. I never imagined I could be so proud of money. Light of heart I left the shop, not that I had made my fortune yet, but what was greater happiness, I thought to myself, likely to make it. Soon I perceived, with some alarm, how thick and murky the air had grown. The fog was stooping heavily down, and was now become like a wash of gamboge and lamp-black. All the street lamps were lit, though they could not see one another, and every shopkeeper had his little jet. The pavement was no longer slippery, but sticky and dry, and a cold that pierced to the bones was stealing along. Already it had begun to freeze, and I, so familiar both with white and black frost, observed with no small interest the grey or fog-frost which was new to me. How different from the pure whiteness when the stars are sparkling, and the earth is gleaming, and the spirit of man so buoyant! This grey fog-frost is rather depressing to most natures, and a chilly damp creeps to the core of all things. Thick and crusting rime comes with it, and sometimes a freezing rain. Before I reached the new road the fog had grown so dense and dark that I was much inclined to take a cab for fear of losing my way but I could not see one, and finding myself at last in a main thoroughfare called the Hampstead Road, I walked on briskly and bravely till I reached Camden Town, when I knew what course to pursue. Slowly wending up College Street, for I was getting tired, and the fog thicker than ever, indeed every step seemed to thrust into an ochred wall, I heard a plaintive and rather musical voice, chanting, much as follows, Christian friends and sisters in the Lord, all who own a heart that feels for undeserved distress, aid, I implore you, a bereaved wife and mother, who has this very moment seven small lovely children starving in a garret, three of them upon a bed of sickness, and the inhuman landlord for the sake of a few shillings about to turn them this bitter night into the flinty streets. Christian friends, may you never know what it is to be famished as I and my seven darlings are this very night, in the midst of plenty, from Plymouth in Devonshire I walked two hundred fifty miles afoot, all the way to join my beloved husband in London. When I came to this Christian city, Georgiana, pick up that halfpenny, he had been ordered off in the transport ship Hippopotamus, to shed his blood for his queen and country, and I, who have known the smiles of plenty in my happy rustic home, am compelled for the sake of my children to the degradation of publicly soliciting alms. The smallest trifle, even an old pair of shoes or a left-off garment, will be received with the heartfelt gratitude of the widow and orphan. My eldest child, ma'am, the oldest of seven, bad in the whooping cough. Georgiana, curtsy to the pretty lady and show her your broken chilblains. No, thank you, I said. I could just see her through the fog. She looked like one who had seen better days, and the thought of my own vicissitudes opened my heart toward her. How could I show my gratitude better for the money I had just earned than by bestowing a share in charity upon worthy objects? So I took out my purse, an elegant little French one given me by dear mother, and placed my three new shillings in the poor creature's hand as she stood in the gutter. She was overpowered with gratitude and could not speak for a moment. Then she came nearer to bless me. Sweet lady, in the name of seven famishing innocents, whom you have saved from death this night, may he who guards the fatherless and the widow from his mercy seat above, may he shower his richest blessings. Snap! She had got my purse and was out of sight in the fog. Georgiana's red heels were the last thing I saw. For an instant I could not believe it, but thought that the fog had affected my sight. Then I darted across the road, almost under the feet of a horse, and down a place called Pratt Street. It was hopeless. 
utterly hopeless, and not only my three pounds were gone, but half besides of all I had in the world. I had taken that money with me, because I meant, if fortune with my landscape, to buy a large box of colours in Rathbone Place, but the fog had deterred me. She had snatched my purse while I tried to clasp it, for my glove had first got in the way. All was gone, dear mother's gift, my first earnings, and all. More than all I felt sore at heart from the baseness of the robbery. Nothing is so bitterly grievous to youth as a blow to faith in one's species. I am not ashamed to confess that, feeling all alone in the fog, I leaned against some iron railings and cried away like a child. Child I was still at heart, despite all my trials in spirit, and more so, perhaps, than girls who have played out their childhood. In the full flow of my passion, for I was actually sobbing aloud, ashamed of myself all the while, I felt an arm steal round my waist, and, starting in fear of another thief, confronted the loveliest face that human eyes ever looked on. With soft caresses and sweetest smiles it drew close to my own stormy and bitter countenance. "'Are you better now, dear? Oh, don't cry so. You'll break your poor little heart. Do tell me what it is. That's a dear. I'll do anything to help you.' "'You can't help me,' I exclaimed through my sobs. "'Nobody can help me. I was born to ill luck, and shall have nothing else till I die.' "'Don't say so, dear. You mustn't think of it. My father, who is never wrong, says there's no such thing as luck. I know that well enough. People always say that who have it on their side. Ah, I never thought of that. But I hope you are wrong. But tell me, dear, what is the matter with you? I'm sure you have done no harm, and dear Papa says no one can be unhappy who has not injured any one. Can't they, though? Your Papa is a moralist. Now I'll just tell you facts. And to prove my point, I told her of this new trouble, hinted at previous ones and my many great losses, of which money was the least. Even without the controversial spirit, I must have told her all. There was no denying anything to such a winning, loving face. Dear me, she cried very thoughtfully, with her mites of hands out of her muff. She had the prettiest set of fur I ever beheld, and how it became her. Dear me, she couldn't have meant it. I feel quite sure she couldn't. You'll come to my opinion when you have time to consider, dear. This was said so sagely that I could have kissed her all over like a duck of a baby. To steal from you, who had just given her more than you could afford. Now come with me, dear. You shall have all the money I've got, though I don't think it anything like the nine pounds you've lost, and I'm sure it is not new money, only I haven't got it with me. I never carry money. Do you know why, dear? No, how should I? Well, I don't mind telling you, because then I can't spend it or give it away. I don't care a bit about money. What good is it to me? Why, I can never keep it, somehow or other. But Papa says if I can show five pounds on Christmas Day, he will put five more on top of it. And then do you know what I'll do? I'll give away five and spend the rest for Pappy and Conrad. And the lively little thing clapped her hands at the prospect, quite forgetting that she had just offered me all her store. Presently this occurred to her. No. Now I come to think of it, I won't have the five pounds on Christmas Day. As the girls at the college say, I'll just sell the old pappy. That will be better fun still. He will find a good reason for it. He always does for everything. You shall have every bit of it. Come home with me now, that's a dear. You are better now, you know. Come, that's a love. I am sure I shall love you with all my heart, and you are so terribly unlucky. I yielded at once. She was so loving and natural I could not resist her. She broke upon me like soft sunshine through the fog, laughing, smiling, dancing, her face all light and warmth, yet not a shallow light, but one that played up from the fount of tears. Her deep, rich, violet eyes seldom used their dark lashes, except when she was asleep. She was life itself, quick, playful, loving life, feeling for and with all life around, pitying, trusting, admiring all things, yet true as the hearth to household ties. I never found another such nature. It was the perfection of maiden womanhood, even in its unreason, and therefore nobody could resist her. With me, of ten times her strength of will and power of mind, small though it be, she could do in a moment exactly as she liked. I mean, of course, in trivial matters. It was impossible to be offended with her. When she had led me a few steps toward her home, for I went with her, not, of course, to take her money, but to see her safe, she turned round suddenly. "'Oh, I forgot, dear. I must not take you to our house. We have had new orders. But where do you live? I will bring you my little bag to-morrow. They won't let me out again to-night. Now I know you will oblige me. I am so sorry that I mustn't see you safe home, dear.' This she said with the finest air of protection imaginable. I gave her my name and address, and asked for hers. 
my name is isola ross i am seventeen and a half and my papa is professor at the college i ran away from old cora it seemed such fun to be all alone in the fog what trouble i shall get into but they can't be angry with me long kiss me darling mind to-morrow off she danced through the fog and i went sadly home yet thinking more of her than my serious and vexatious loss end of book two chapter eleven